Hi there, I'm Jay Lippman, this is The Day Before Tomorrow, and today, talking about climate change without making people sad. And to do that, we're talking to Rolly Williams. Now, Rolly is one of the leaders in the world at talking about climate change through the lens of comedy, and he does that via his YouTube channel, Climate Town. Now, Climate Town has around half a million followers who tune in to listen to what Rolly has to say about the most important issues through a funny lens. Rolly, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm pleased as punch to be here on this magnificent big green set, or whatever color we make it. Now, Rolly, everyone has an origin, right? Where did you learn about your ability to talk about climate change through the lens of comedy? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I was given a time slot at a comedy theater after somebody dropped out and they just needed somebody to fill 20 minutes and I didn't have anything to put in there, but I thought, I'll just, I'll make something up, I'll come up with something. And I was at a Barnes and Noble and I saw Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, the book, which is a book mm. print now, I guess. And I thought, oh, it would be funny if Al Gore went on like a I Told You So tour and was like kind of strung out and maybe play him like a sexy grandpa who's like, mm. maybe like sexually liberated and a little drunk and that that would be kind of a fun host of a show. And so I put that show up at this comedy theater and it was, I did terrible, it was a bad, bad show. But um, like maybe a year later I put it up again at a different theater and it kind of worked a little bit better if I brought in experts who actually knew something about climate change. And so after about six months of performing this show at Caveat Theater in Manhattan, um, I would go out to the bars afterwards with a climate scientist that would come on to the comedy show. And every time I would talk to somebody at a bar, one of these scientists, they were just like, this problem is worse than you think. Like, we are nowhere close to really wrapping our heads around this, this problem as a society. This is going to really be the thing that bones us culturally. And so I thought, okay, this is obviously like, this is a bigger deal than I thought. Um, and this kind of rinky-dink comedy live show isn't quite going to cut it. So I went back to school. I went to Columbia and got a graduate degree in climate science and policy. And then I started this YouTube channel. I love it. One of the things that you've done so well, and one of the things you talk about is meeting people where they're at, mm. right? Connecting to whether someone is a climate expert or whether they're dabbling in this climate curious. Like, what do you mean by meeting people where they're at? You talk about it and you've done it so effectively. Like, tell us about it. Yeah, I think it's more like... Um, People aren't looking for a lecture, and people aren't looking to have be talked down to or anything. Um, and I spend a huge amount of my time, too much really, uh, on the internet and you know on Reddit and YouTube. And I and so my kind of cultural touchstone is digital, is is from the perspective of the internet. And there are you know four billion people online at any given time. Not at any given time. I don't know how many people there are online. It's probably a goddamn lot of people though. And so where people are at is the internet. That's mm -hmm. our shared language, that's our shared culture, that's the way we can like translate issues across the pond for you. I'm hearing that accent. I know you're from not from America. It's fake. It makes me sound smarter, but yeah. Well, it's you're nailing it. And you sound very smart. And he looks very smart. Put it on put it on the book. Um but anyway, uh, I just assume that it's a better medium for talking to people mm. through a way that I would want to listen to it if I was the one being talked to. Mm. So I try to meet people where they're at by like meeting them online, basically. And one of the things, you know, over the years, we've seen people use data, we've seen people use documentaries, a lot of, you know, fear, a lot of reality you've used comedy and you've mm -hmm. made that the kind of foundation of this brand that has done incredibly well and continues to accelerate and get more traction. Why comedy? Why is it breaking through? Why do you think there's so much demand for it? Um, well, for one, I did pay the Upright Citizens Brigade $5,000 in improv classes, so I gotta get my money out of them one way or another. Um, but also, it's just like, when there's a big problem, that is tough to listen to and tough to think about. It's not helped by being really morose and depressing about it. It might be a depressing thing and it might um, concoct depressing emotions in people, but to start from a point of depression 
is just going to kind of compound the issue and make it something that people aren't interested in talking about. We don't talk about death that often because it's a scary topic, even though it is an inevitable thing that will happen to everybody. And I think climate change kind of accidentally gets lumped in the same bucket. It's easy to talk about it in a depressing way because it is depressing. Mm. So I think like trying to convey the information in a way that is a little more upbeat and a little more honest, but also accessible through maybe being humorous. Um, I think that's a way that people are able to like click into the information and, and listen to it and engage with it and learn because Mo, you know, like every every goddamn Yale climate change study says that like most people understand climate change is happening and most people are worried about it. But the amount of people who believe in it and the amount of people who are like willing to help galvanize the political will to change it is very different. And I think that's like one of the ways to, you know, uh, what's that word where you turn metal into gold? Okay. Alchemize. Okay. Yeah, the way to alchemize people is to present them with the information in a way that is digestible and then hope that they will make the right decision, which I genuinely think they will. One of the things I've seen you do so successfully that's so hard is balancing information and reality with solutions and optimism. You know, telling people where we're at and then helping people know how we're going to get out of it and what the solutions are. Mm. How did you find that formula and how do you continue to, to build on it? I think it's it's sort of the, a, a natural part of the, the story, right? Like when you're, when you're talking about an issue, like, oh, here's the issue. Here's how bad it is. Here's where we are now. I think, I think it's a natural way to conclude the story. It's like, oh, and here's what we could do if we changed the way we operate and here's probably where things will go if we don't change. And so part of part of telling the story of change, wow, put that on a pillow. Telling the story of change, love that. Part of telling the story of change, TM, uh, is, is also describing the potential solutions if we were to take this problem really seriously. And so I think, and that's honestly the hardest part to do properly because Problems that are sufficiently large do not have easy solutions. You know, there's this phrase, I think you probably have heard of it. It's a wicked problem. I think that's like the, and I know you would think wicked, like, oh, that's cool, because that's what wicked means in England circa 2008. But um, this is a wicked problem. Like, it's got a lot of evil tendrils that intertwine and prevent any solutions mm. from really a, a, taking root without some concerted effort. Wicked did mean cool in 2008, right? I think it was 2004 to 2011. Oh, it nailed had its heyday. I'm yeah. right in the middle. 2008 was the period. perfect date for you. With a pair, of, a pair of baggy jeans, you're thriving. Uh, so your audience, you know, is heavily YouTube centric. Mm. It's probably, I imagine, skews relatively young. When you know we see that Gen Z is activated around this topic, mm. they are engaged, they're getting educated, and they're the most advanced of all the generations in knowing the situation and wanting to find solutions. Mm -hmm. How do you think about communicating this to some of those generations that are not as educated or engaged and actually do currently have the power to change a lot of the systems that we need to change? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I don't have a really strong answer for that. I think. I think typically the generations that are in control of a lot of the, the, the handles that, you know, change things, I think they're less terminally online. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, th I think it's hard for me to reach out to them because I don't think they, they, you know, travel in the same digital circles as I'm trying to like spew content into. Um, but what they do listen to is like, the people shouting loudly enough to drown out the money that is being poured on them from interest groups. And I, I just heard myself say that and I, I'm trying to clock how much like Bernie Sanders I sounded like just then, because I did just see him at, at, in Brooklyn mm -hmm. and he still got it. The dude still got it. Um, no, I think, I think I'm trying to maybe reach them through um, other people. So like what I what I, I think maybe my mission for communication is to just communicate the facts with the context to 
the 18 to 36 kind of demographic and then hopefully there they will kind of trojan horse that mm. information into like an older demo that's got their fingers on the buttons i mean we've seen so many cases of creating that movement then educating a large group of individuals that disseminating into some form of policy either through political pressure mm. economic pressure consumption uh changes and so and we've seen that not work a lot of times too. yes so like yeah. that yeah and it was also interesting to see how it works in the US versus some European examples, mm. especially recently, where those movements have been more effective. Mm. Um, but then you've also got the you know, American political landscape with the Inflation Reduction Act showing that you know, there is a lot of progress happening It's here. possible. We, yeah. can, we can do it, too. Your videos have had so much success with the younger generation, what do you think resonates most deeply with them and how do you continue to activate them around the climate conversation? Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the youngest generation that is like coming up online right now, I think they're the most educated on the climate crisis because they're, they, they've, they are they were born into a world that was already feeling the effects mm. and like could, you know, you could just see the obvious changes to the climate that are happening all across the world and also in, in places in the States um, where, where maybe more of the audience that I'm trying to target is currently living. Mm. And so I think for them, it's a matter of convincing them not that climate change is happening and, and a big problem because they already know that fundamentally, but like kind of convincing them that they are the solution and that the, a solution is possible and even maybe even potentially likely because there has been so little progress made on the climate crisis that i mean to a reasonable 15 year old it's uh, maybe it won't be solved you know because like th we knew about climate change for 34 years you know like like the the james hansen testimony was in 88 you mm -hmm. know and like in no uncertain terms, this is a big problem. We got to solve it, and everyone's like, "Oh, okay." And then, thirty-four years later, here we are. You know, and, and so like, yeah, that's not a great track record. And so I think it's it's about like, change is possible, and kind of kind of that for for them. I think the how do we get out of this is the most important piece of the mm -hmm. equation for maybe a, a little bit of an older demographic. The how did we get into this is a more important yeah. piece of the equation. And hopefully together, we're gonna row this boat, you know, right out of the, the crisis. I, I, I should have worked on that metaphor at the end because I almost had a landing stuck there until I blew it at the end. We'll fix it in post. Great, right. yeah, just put like a green screen hulk over this. So Rolly, you very kindly offered to teach me your ways, right? That's to right. help me to try to be a fraction as funny as you are. What do you have in mind? Um, well, that's a great question. So you prepared some climate comedy stand-up that you've worked on. Yeah, a little bit. Excellent. Now, you can't really get a sense of how material works unless you're in front of an audience. So okay. we went ahead and booked a little comedy club. But you got to be able to read a room and, and pitch it to a different audience depending on who you get. Mm. So we got Elias and Nina here. Can you guys come on out here? This is going to be your audience for today. Okay. You're really pitching this material to the next generation. Oh, wow, the next next generation. That's that right. Fantastic. So you really got to make these two laugh. Okay, they're a tough crowd. We'll get started. All right, are you guys ready for some uh, stand-up comedy about climate change? Yeah. yeah. All right, Jay, take it away. Okay, guys, be gentle. I'm pretty nervous. Okay, so what did the cows call their climate legislation? The Green Moo Deal. <laughs> I gotta laugh. I gotta laugh. No, that's because no one's laughing. Oh! Okay, I need some help. I need some help. It's okay, it's an open mic. You're allowed to go to your notebook. Why did the glacier break up with the mountain? Why? Why? Because they were drifting apart. Get it. Tough crowd. I think it's it's a context thing. I think you if you set up the yeah the the yeah hit, hit us hit us with the, like hit us with the green moon deal joke, but tell us <laughs> the context. So America just passed a very important climate bill, which is a piece of legislation, right? Dab 
Exactly. <laughs> That's a climate legislation dab. And in doing so, they called it the Inflation Reduction Act. And some people think that there's need for a bigger piece of legislation called the Green New Deal. So what did the cows call their proposed climate legislation? The Green Moo Deal. Ah. There we go, there we go. Do you like polar bears? What? Yeah. Do you like polar bears? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, love, bears? I love them. Sometimes, you know, I think, why didn't the polar bear go to the party? Because he heard it was going to be an absolute meltdown. Ah! Uh, I, I don't get it. Okay, you guys cover your ears. All right. Out of, out of the jokes you told, which one did they respond to the best, do you think? Mm. None of them. None they of them, okay. Not. But there was, surely there was a couple that like, we, we got a couple little ch mm. chuckles out of. I think we'll go for the, uh, the Green Moo deal the fifth time. Oh. <laughs> uh, that, uh, the meta-ness the meta of that joke is funny to me, yeah. but I think they liked it because you said cow. So you know the, the polar bear meltdown joke? Mm. I bet they really liked it when you said meltdown at the end. So maybe if you like acted out what a, what a party meltdown would look like to a polar bear, like a penguin's like, sliding into each other and like, mm. you know, the, the kelp is all over the food or something and like mm. really sell it, okay. they might like that. Okay. All right. Okay. Nice. So we're going back to the polar bears, which I know you guys liked. And we're just thinking, why didn't the polar bear want to go to the party? Because he turned up and it was an absolute meltdown. The kelp dip was all bad, right? The slushies were melted. Okay, and the dessert, the penguin egg dessert. It was at that moment that I realized I had turned Jay into a full-blown comedian for children. And that was going to be really hard because comedy's difficult and children are unpredictable. But maybe, just maybe, he could get a new generation into the climate conversation. As long as he never says Green Moo Deal ever again.